he said, after even so come. So I thought that was the declaration for me. Now I got a text. Right, well, let me, let me go back before that. Um, so we were working on, I think, this series of sermons, uh, I think back in January, February. I don't remember when. And uh, we were kind of given a list of topics to choose from. And uh, I chose faith. Chose faith and, and uh, chose faith because I knew I was going to have the opportunity to preach twice, and so th this idea for this period of time is the idea of justification in faith, and hopefully we'll unpack that a little bit. The next time, and I think May is sanctification in faith. And the, the two just really go well together, and I got a passage that fits that whole idea. Um, that, was a long, that was a long time ago when that came up. And um, a, a lot has happened since then that, that, br that brought th these ideas to life for me, this idea to life for me. Uh, and so I, I want to do two things. I want to have two goals overall, big, big picture goals this morning. Uh, well, one, I want to uh, reveal my heart and then, two, I want to share my hope. Um, my heart is hurt. Five weeks ago today, my best friend lost his sister. One, one week ago today, I got the opportunity to preach to um, that congregation where my best friend ministers. 
And it was, it was beautiful. It was rough. It's still rough. It's very rough, as you can tell. Um, this, is, this is my buffalo wings, wild wings bite. Um, a lot of you know, I, I look forward to that, that weekend, which was last weekend. And uh, that, that weekend was one month after his sister died. His sister being 42, 43. Um, the second sister he's lost. He's now siblingless. But he has a brother. And so I'm thinking about this idea of faith. And I'm thinking two ideas. One idea I, I wanted to share with, with him, with them. And then two ideas I want to share with us. Um, and this is the idea I shared with him. And then in his family and his church body. It, is your faith able to withstand the storms of life? Is your faith able to withstand the storms of life? And I, I know there's been a lot of storms of life um, just through this body. Um, but everybody responds and reacts to the storms differently. Everybody, it's, it's that, I mentioned the last time I preached, you throw a rock in, in the water and there's a ripple effect. Um, and the ripples go out and everybody in some way, shape, or form becomes impacted by the storms of somebody's life. Uh, this is probably, this, this, is, this is the struggle that I'm still working through and processing. Uh, it's, it's probably been the closest ripple effect uh, that, I, that I've had personally in my life for, for kind of a personal storm and witnessing um, a storm in the life of a, a dear friend, a dear brother. And so I, 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 that was just so much on my mind. Is your faith able to withstand the storms of life? And then right on the heels of that, I think, uh, I, I had this thought. It is, is your faith one that you think makes you exempt from the storms of life? Is, is your faith one that makes you think you're exempt from the storms of life? And so I kind of want to flesh out the, these, these ideas today. Um, revealing my heart, sharing, sharing my own faith. Um, two, two passages briefly here uh, in the book of Hebrews the author writes now faith is the reality the assurance of what is hoped for this is the whole of the Christian standard uh, whole of the Christian, whole of the Christian standard conversion uh, now faith is the reality assurance of what is hoped for the proof or the conviction of what is not seen the assurance, the conviction. Uh, and, and we know later the author of Hebrews now without faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Since so the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists. Believe, assurance, proof, conviction that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Then Paul writes, one we're very familiar with, for you are saved by grace through faith. It's not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from works that so no one can boast for you are you're saved by grace through faith, the, the justification by faith. Um, faith is not this willy-nilly, I, I wish, I hope, as some of us got into over the last few weeks with March Madness, that I wish this team wins, I hope this team wins. I have faith that UVA will pull it out this year. Um, I, I didn't think it would happen. I didn't have faith in UVA, shame on me. Uh, I put my faith in Michigan, shame on me. 
<laughs> and so, um, what is what is our faith, and what what is the object of of our faith? I'm, I'm going to show a quick video now. If if you get startled easily, I, I forgot. I didn't know that the little ones would be in here. I didn't know the older ones would be in here as well. If you get startled easily, I'm just going to warn you in advance. 20 seconds, 25 seconds in. I'm just going to warn you in advance. Some of you are still going to jump. I'm going to watch. I should video this. This would be funny. Um, but can you roll that video, please? Jesus Christ is coming back for his church. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. I want you to know, church, that Jesus Christ could come this month, or he might come next week, or he could even come next week. By what you did, by what you do, 
or by what you believe in terms of what you have heard. came across this idea recently, which I think helps grasp, put some flesh and blood on this idea. Um, the author of this article write, writes, uh, it is the present form of Christianity, uniquely influenced by American culture, that is failing precisely because it has been enculturated with ideas foreign to the kingdom of God and the good news of the kingdom. In essence, the American church has succumbed to the lure of personal peace and affluence elements of the American dream. With the separation of the good news, the gospel, from the inbreaking rule and reign of God inaugurated at the cross, many American Christians have come to perceive the gospel as merely an addition, an add-on to an already well-lived life. In other words, continuation of one's life according to one's own place, seasoned with a little piety, of course, but relying on God to ensure one's entrance into heaven upon death. The basis of this is often rooted in the efficiency of one's own belief or intellectual assent to the facts of Jesus apart from any obligation, apart from any obligation to Jesus as king. This would be akin to the New Testament Christians professing belief in Jesus, but continuing to live in allegiance to Caesar. Let me read that again. This would be akin, this would be similar to what, what, what this author seen in modern day Christianity in America would be equivalent to New Testament Christians professing belief in Jesus but continuing to live in allegiance to Caesar. However, Jesus and the apostles thought that one must repent and renounce allegiance to the kingdoms of this world, including the kingdom of self, and to submit to the world's rightful ruler, Jesus. This is then followed with the belief in the fact that all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 20, 18, has been given to the promised King Jesus who lives and who reigns. And we get to that idea, we've allowed culture to determine what Christianity looks like. We've allowed culture to determine what it is to be a Christian more than we've allowed the scripture. This is even infiltrated, I believe, the church came across this. Assuming for a moment that there is really a heaven, this is a different article, or different, from a different book, what do you think are the general requirements for admission? Who gets in, who doesn't? Anyone who asks one of these questions to a random sample of church-going people will be surprised at the large number who say one of the following. In other words, why do you believe that you're saved? What, what, what is the basis of your salvation? How, how do you know you're ready? Because I have tried my best to be a good Christian. Because I believe in God and try to do His will. Because I believe in God with all of my heart. Responses that people give to the assurance of their salvation. The author goes on to say this is not a trick question. It reveals common misconceptions about what it means to believe, what it means to have faith. Answer A, because I tried my best to be a good Christian, is salvation by works. That's what Paul asked the Galatians. Like one, learn one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law? Is that the basis of your salvation? I've tried my best to be a good Christian. Answer B is salvation by faith plus works. Because I believe in God and try to do His will. And answer C, salvation is by faith as a work. In each case, the person is religious. But is not someone who does not work. They have not done a real trust transfer. 
None of these are biblical, though, as a result of what it means to be a Christian. How does one become a Christian? None of those responses will work. Paul, before Galatians 3.2, says, says this, which would be Galatians 3.1. Okay? You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. With that said, Paul then, I'd like to learn just this one thing from you. Did you come to salvation through this or through this? Now, what I want to do with the rest of these ideas is three things. One, I, I want us to consider briefly here the place of the cross in history. The place. How the cross has a place in history. Two, the purpose of the cross in history. Now the cross has a purpose that is historical. And three, how it solves the greatest problem of all. Paul, Paul is here speaking to the Galatians in a very interesting way. He says at the end of Galatians 3.1, before your very eyes, as plain as plain could be, no question is asked. You saw it. It was taught to you. It was explained to you. There were no questions. There was no objections. Christ was crucified. To then come away from as plain as plain could be, and then Paul says, you foolish Galatians, Foolish. You unthinking Galatians. You unwise Galatians. Have you failed to consider? Have you failed to reconsider? Have you not put thought into this? I mean, we could all, we, we could spend the next long period of time talking about stories of our foolishness. Our foolishness. And I think we'd come to the same conclusion with every scenario we look back and say, that was foolish. That was foolish. That was foolish. I just wasn't thinking. Just wasn't thinking. I, I was watching something. I don't remember where I was watching this. I don't remember what, what I was watching. I, I remember this. When, when um, someone from... This region is the way that the speaker was telling the story. Region of Appalachia. Hey, y'all, watch this. When somebody says that, hey, y'all, watch this, you just know the results isn't going to be good. Foolish. Foolish. Who has bewitched you? Who has, other versions put, who has cast a spell on you? Who has hypnotized you? It's as plain and obvious as obvious could be, but you're missing. Somebody came in and told you a lie. Someone came in and caused you to think differently. Before your very eyes, Christ was visibly portrayed as as crucified.
crucified. It was as public as public could be. A, a verifiable, documented reality in history. It has a place in history because it was an event that actually happened. I, I love the way the author of this cartoonish thing here states this. I just get to read it to you. How Christianity started. I want to read the other one first. How other religions started. A private dream about God. A private encounter about God. A private idea about God. And then that one person told everyone else about his private encounter. That's not Christianity. After a public ministry, Christ was publicly killed and then publicly rose from a public tomb. He then publicly showed himself to the public. That public then told everyone what they saw. The crucifixion has a place in history. Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was visibly portrayed as crucified. Lee Strobel says Christianity is a very historical religion. It makes specific claims that are open to testing. Crucifixion has a place in history. And I, I assure you, when, when the storms of life come and your faith is in the historical reality, and I've talked about this before, your faith is in the, is in the historical reality of a real event that happened, your faith is in something that cannot change. Because the historical event cannot change. So when, 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 I, when my best friend loses his sister, and as hard as that is, our faith is in something that cannot change ever. Because the cross is something that is that holds a place in history. Not only does the cross hold a place in history, the cross has a purpose in history. This then leads us into the idea of how do I know what does it mean to be <coughs> saved? Here Paul writes, did you come to your salvation by works of the law? Or did you come to your salvation because of what you heard? Now, what did they hear? The truth of the gospel. The good news. That mankind is justified by faith in Jesus Christ. In the midst of prep, preparing for this, I came across this, this, I don't know if it's a quote, it's a paragraph, it's long, part of an article. This is the question that Paul needs the church to answer correctly. And it's a question I think that we need to answer correctly today. The reason why it's so pivotal for the Apostle Paul and for so many of the New Testament authors as if is this, if we don't understand the idea of justification correctly, to be justified, to be declared innocent, to be set free, to, to know that one has freedom, if we don't understand justification correctly, we not only misunderstand our own salvation, we misunderstand who Christ is as well. We think that we can somehow be justified on our own 
or perhaps contribute something of our own, that means we must reconfigure who Jesus is and what he has done. That the gospel itself, that, mean, that, that means the gospel itself has been changed entirely. One of the things that we've been doing with um, my Bible 11 class, we, we've been looking at the question all year for the most part. This series of questions, who is Jesus? What is his identity? What do he do? Why do he do it? And uh, we, we've, been, we've been looking at that from different angles and different situations and different periods of time throughout Jesus' ministry. And uh, came to this idea at some point in time in the last month or so. If the identification that we place on Jesus, so we, we're going to label Jesus, this is who he is. This is who he is. And we, we get an idea we, 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 and, and we define that. It could be a myriad of things. It could be a myriad of things that are very, very accurate. But, but let me suggest this, and this is where that quote came into play. If we think we can somehow be justified on our own, perhaps contribute something of our own, that means we must reconfigure who Jesus is and what he's done. If our identification of who Jesus is, in whatever capacity we're defining him as such, does not eventually place him or have him tied to the cross, then somehow we have a misunderstanding or a, a, a misperception of who he is. If we don't tie him as ultimate Messiah and Savior who had to come and die on that very excruciating, painful spiritually painful public cross, we don't tie that to his identity, then we've got something wrong. And we've got something horribly wrong. It's got to be tied to, first and foremost, who is he? The Son of God who came to die in our place. To take our wrath. To take our punishment. To justify us. Just as if I never sinned. We don't make that connection. We just acknowledge Jesus as, as healer or helpmate or friend or this goes on. And those ideas aren't tied specifically to the cross. Something's like it. Our belief in who Jesus is and what he did and why he did it must be tied to why he came, his purpose for coming. We had a problem that needed to be solved. Now, important side note. Important side note. And you're going to get a whole different realm of understandings and explanations and what have you as it relates to what I'm going to talk about. Okay? So if we are saved, justification by faith. Where and how then does the role of baptism play in? Okay? Now, let me say this as, as, as explanation primarily, 8th grade. Was it 8th grade, Mr. Bowman? You remember? Eighth grade. You know what I'm talking about? Eighth grade. Yeah, we the, the question came up with our BGU BJU friends. And uh, he one of them gave me the explanation of Christ speaking to the thief on the cross. Okay. About why baptism is not necessarily part of the equation of salvation. Okay. I I I, I have a problem with that because Number one, that, that, that event occurred before Christ's death. And before ultimately the institution of baptism. Okay? So, let me just say, I don't know that I would put full account into that answer. I want you to think, I want you to believe what you believe and know why you believe it and understand it to be true. Okay? 
not to just throw out baptism at all, though. Okay, because it's 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 important. Now, with that said, with that said, I, I came across this. I found this to be interesting. Um, this is part of the the history, what's called the brief and mostly true history of the religion of the Ukraine. So I guess back in the day, and I don't have the date in front of me here, uh, the, the leader of the Ukraine was Vladimir. And he sent some people on this mission to find out, okay, what, what, what religion is the best religion out there that we should believe? And this one was considered and thrown out, this one was considered and thrown out, this one was accepted. And this is the way the author writes this. And again, the title of the chapter was a brief and mostly true. But there's a point you'll get from this. Converting to Greek Orthodoxy is what they did. Vladimir became a lover of all things Greek. So much so that he immediately declared war on Constantinople in an effort to possess it. The Greeks explained to them this really wasn't a very Christian thing to do. It seemed that he had misunderstood what Christians meant by, you ready for this? Sword drill. Been too long. Been too long. He needed baptism, they said. And he agreed. He then enthusiastically required all of his subjects, under penalty of death, to be baptized too. Vlad made a lot of converts this way. Publicly, the Greeks declared him a saint. Privately, they considered him a slow learner. Now, I don't necessarily believe that all those people under Vladimir who were baptized were saved. Okay? So just because baptism occurs does not mean salvation occurs. Definitely a role within it. Definitely a part within it. Definitely preceding baptism. Proper understanding of repentance. Proper understanding of confession. Proper understanding of justification and why that is necessary. The article I was reading earlier about in present Christian form, we're falling apart, concludes with this idea. Finally, we are commanded to be baptized. Today, however, baptism is often regarded as merely our public profession of faith. Something we do to show our newfound faith to others. Now, I think it's also interesting to note here that Vladimir said, you must be baptized or you die. I think, I'm not, don't quote me on this one, but just think through this one with me. First century Christianity, still under the realm of Roman rule. Quite possibly to be baptized, to, to proclaim allegiance to Christ, not Caesar, then and there, they, I don't think they had baptistries and churches yet. Okay? They had to take a body of water, wherever it was, and go to that body of water and perform the rite of baptism. Which, which I tend to think was a very public place. Which then puts a very public target on you for, for denying Caesar in embracing Christ. So I think quite likely when baptism was originally instituted, to be baptized was to then have a target on your back. And people willingly were baptized anyway. I don't think it's that way today. I think what, what I'm trying to show here is trying to find the happy place, if there is such a happy place, between these ideas of baptism's role within salvation. The article continues. However, baptism is often regarded merely our public profession as faith, something we do to show our newfound faith to others. However, Peter associated baptism with Noah and his family being saved through water, 1 Peter 3.20. However, saved in this instance does not necessarily mean going to heaven, but living in a new world under the rule of God. 
Notice that Peter says baptism is the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. Dr. Alan Street points out the Greek word translated pledge comes from the business community of first century Rome. It referred to a verbal promise at the end of a contract. It was a pledge to fulfill the agreement and it was very legally binding. Peter here tells us that baptism is our pledge of loyalty to Christ and his kingdom. Renouncing pledge to this world and all that it supposedly has to offer us and embracing the kingdom of God, our pledge, our contract as such. I think it's a very fascinating idea. Upon taking this pledge, Christians are to live as those who have been saved from death to live presently in a new society under the reign and rule of Jesus. Thus, the Christian renounces his citizenship in this world along with the ways of this world and becomes a citizen of God's kingdom on earth, following the way of the king. And what is that way? It is the way of the cross. Jesus did not defeat the kings of this world through force, but through costly love expressed in sacrifice. This is the way of the kingdom. Justification by faith resulting in baptism leading to salvation. What does all this mean for you? What does all this mean for me? On what basis do you consider yourself to be saved? Paul challenged the Galatians. Christ was visibly, publicly portrayed as crucified. What have you done with that reality? That leads me to the last and quick point. We talked about the place the cross has in history. We talked about the purpose. But before all that, we have to talk about the problem that Christ solved. When you and I were born, we were basically born on death row. We were born into the world of sin. We were born into the world of the sin nature. We had a problem. We were separated from our creator. We had no union with God. We had no connection with God. We were lost. Scripture says we were dead in our trespasses and transgressions. We were hopeless. We were helpless. And if we can't even begin to grasp the, the position that we were in before Christ entered our lives, before we heard the gospel, then the gospel, I would argue, is pointless. Because if Jesus came to die for my sins, and I don't see my sin as a problem, I don't see that I have a problem, then in my mind, Jesus died pointlessly. Because I don't have a problem. I don't have anything to point to for why he needed to die for me. You know, I've had conversations with people about this, and they say, well, what are you talking to me for? What about so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so? And, so and, so? and we just begin playing the comparison game. But notice we never compare ourselves to somebody better. It's always somebody worse to make ourselves look better, to make ourselves feel better, knowing deep down inside that something's wrong. Something's really wrong. I have a problem. And you know how you know you have a problem? You know how I know I have a problem? And I, I mentioned this briefly earlier this week, and I've said it before. When you're squeezed, what's on the inside comes out. And I know, I know with, with dealing with my friend's sister's death and all that and the rigors of the reality of the end of the school year, squeezing has been going on for me. And it hasn't always been pretty with what comes out. That's just to show me what's really inside. It's not pretty. I need it home. And I have it in Christ. And I am justified in and I'm free in Christ because I recognize my fallenness in need of Christ. 
Yeah, that makes sense. So unless we recognize that we have a problem, the solution of the place of the cross in history and the purpose of the cross in history means nothing. So I conclude with these ideas. Is Christ's death everything to you? What difference does his death make regarding your love for him and your actions in this life? Christ said, or Paul said to the Galatians, Christ has been before your eyes clearly portrayed as crucified. He is our hope. There is no other. Now, throughout life, when the band can start coming forward, we're going to have opportunities throughout life where, where something jolts us to recognize a truth or a reality that we weren't aware of before. And I think that's that's part of what I'm getting at, what I've got at as a re as I reveal my, my heart and how, how much I show, because there's some been, there have been realities that I've been made aware of that I wasn't so much aware of before. And I've got to respond and, and address that. Maybe the same might be true for you, thinking, well, I, I, I know I'm saved because, but you've thought through, for whatever reason, that I did differently, and I just want to pursue that further, think through it more. Paul says in Romans 12, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the light of mind to be renewed through repentance, the way we think, different than the way we once thought, regarding why did Christ come, why did Christ come. We are saved because of Jesus and what he did. And then we respond to that truth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the hope we have in this time. Lord, may your spirit move, work, challenge, convict, or these truths. We pray this in Christ's name.